you very much. And I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be with you. And uh, so I would like to uh, sh uh, share some of the work we have done in the last few years, in particular, uh, how to do scalable analysis of the large scale multi-ethnic bulk bank and whole genome sequencing study. And uh, so I'll do a first uh, uh, introduction. And uh, so the whole gene, so here is the timeline of the whole genome hexon sequencing. And uh, so the, uh, the about uh, 13 years ago, that, that was the launch of 1000 genome project. At that time, the sequencing cost was still pretty high. And so therefore the sequencing um, is, uh, it, depth is pretty low and about five to six ish and only about thousand people were sequenced. And in the last few years, and the, the sequencing costs have dropped dramatically. And the, the, the there are several large whole genome sequencing effort. And the one is by the top med, it's called Transomic Precision Medicine Program by NH, uh, LBI, National Heart Lung Blood Institute. And the other one is by the um, Genome Sequencing Program by NHGRI. And uh, so, the top mad has sequenced over 190,000 whole genome, and uh, the GSP genome sequencing program, in particular, the Center for Complex Disease and um, Genomics, has sequenced about 140,000 whole genome and about 210,000 whole exome. And also, the many large bulk banks have emerged, and more and more whole genome sequencing data are being generated. And a very good example is the UK Bulk Bank, and uh, which uh, have already released 450,000 whole exome uh, sequence and also 200,000 whole genome sequence. And uh, then um, the, the other is a million veteran program, and uh, that will uh, have about over 100,000 whole genome. And also NCI has its own sequencing program, and also it generates the uh, somatic sequence as well. So we do have a large number, a lot of data. So here is a, a quick uh, illustration of TopMed data. So TopMed has sequenced about 120,000 whole genome, and the sequencing depth is pretty uh, deep and about 38x. So you can see the study is very multi-ethnic and with a very good uh, um, mixture of the European, African American, Latino, and Asian. And also it has a many um, multi, multi many phenotypes, including the blood, heart, and lung, and multi-ethnic, uh, multi multiple phenotype as well, mm -hmm. and sleep. And also TopMed has generated uh, multi-omic data, including RNA-seq data, methylation data, metabolomic data, proteinomics data, and so on, for a subset of the samples. And the bulk bank are the trend of in health science. And so the bulk bank basically provide the data, including the genome and the electronic medical record, epidemiological data, imaging data, and wearable devices. And also the a good large number of bulk bank have emerged across many nations. And as I mentioned, the UK bulk bank has a half million people with the GWAS whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. And, and also other bulk bank include the China Kaduri, Finland bulk bank, million version program, Geisinger, Emerge, and so on. And also all of us, which plan to sequence about a million people in the US. And so the goal of those bulk banks are to promote precision health, including pre pre precision prevention and medicine. And in the next few years, we are going to see the millions of whole genome, whole uh, exome sequencing data available. So we have to make analysis scalable to large data. So the few feet, here are the few features of the whole genome and also bulk bank data. So I'll use the um, top mad data as an example. So you can see that uh, here's the top mad free night data about 150,000 whole genome and the over 90% of the variants are non-coding variants. And so you can see that uh, we totally have about 700 million variants, about 46% are singletons, and that means only one person has that particular variant, and the 16% are doubletons. And the common variants only occupy less than 1% of the, the genome. And uh, 
so the the so the, the analysis is challenged by the massive large number of the real variants. So the traditional GWAS analysis is not applicable to such setting. And the second feature is the many large bio banks and the whole genome sequencing study are multi-ethnic. So if you, I mentioned like the how bad uh, is very multi-ethnic and uh, uh, GSP data are very similar to top map data. And also if you look at the million veteran program on the left, it's also very multi-ethnic as well. And also the, the large bio bank and whole genome sequencing data have a lot of relatedness. If you look at the bar plot on the left, then you can see that about one third of the UK bio bank samples are related samples. On the right, you can see the those uh, top med samples, uh, there are lots of relatedness as well. So therefore, in the analysis, we need to account for population structure and also relatedness. So this talk has three parts. The first part is, to, in order to account for population structure, we need to estimate number of ancestry PCs. Then uh, the, we are going to talk about how to estimate the number of ancestry PCs. The second part is to account for both relatedness and population structure, a common approach is to fit the mixed model. And however, when the data are large, how can we make the model fitting scalable? And third is when we analyze the uh, whole genome sequencing study, we need to analyze a large number of real variants. How can we empower real variants association studies? So let me start from part one. How can we estimate the ancestry PCs? So I'm going to introduce this bulk eigenvalue matching analysis we call the BIMR. And so this work was uh, uh, published in JASA uh, last year as co-led by my colleague, Tracy Kerr, and the students, uh, Yu Chung Ma. So as I mentioned, like GWAS study need to control for confounding due to population structure and ancestry. And so the, traditionally, we know that uh, the uh, uh, GWAS or whole genome sequence study involve many ancestry like European, South Asia, East Asia, African American, Hispanic, and so on. And uh, to do the GWAS analysis, so basically, one want to control for confounding due to population structure by including in the covariance age, sex, and ancestry PCs, and analyze this coded as a C, and then the G indicated the SNP. We analyze one SNP at a time in GWAS study, and in whole genome sequence sequencing study, we analyze a set of a time. And so therefore, in order to adjust for population ancestry, one need to estimate the ancestry PCs, which can capture population structure. So the so here you can see this is a, a illustration of ancestry PCs. And then for the first two PC, you can see that have a nice separation of the uh, European, East Asian, and African. Um, um, and also the uh, admixtures as well. And uh, so the if you look at the UK bio bank data, it has a half million people in the GWAS uh, array, it has over 800,000 SNP. So ancestry species are calculated for each person. So then the question is, how many PC should we use? So if you look at the figures on the left, this is the PC plot and using 1000 genome data, then you can see that the, um, there are three uh, corners and in, those are represented by African, European, and also East Asia. And in the middles are the um, South Asians and also admixtures and such as the um, Africans and also Hispanic. And uh, on the right, this is ancestry PC calculated from the CCDG um, uh, data, phase two data has a uh, 60,000 people. Then you can see this is, has a very, um, uh, is very multi-ethnic. So if you compare the figures on the left with the figure on the right, then you can see that 1,000 genome data are not representative. And uh, it doesn't include the, the uh, admixture samples very well, such as the Puerto Ricans and uh, African-Americans. 
And so a natural question is how can we estimate um, ancestry PCs? So the idea is you first use your, you do LD pruning and across the genome, and uh, then you calculate after you do LD pruning, and then you calculate the first K PCs and uh, using the um, genotype matrix. And then you include those PCs and say like first five or first 10 PCs in a GWA scan by fitting this uh, uh, generalized linear model. And a natural question is how can we choose the number of PCs? Should we use five or should we use 10 or should we use 20? And so this can be formulated as the spark, the spike, the covariance model uh, framework. So suppose we have the genotype, um, the, then we uh, assume the uh, the covariance matrix can be written as a spike of covariance matrix, and the, in uh, which is written as the low rank part, and uh, which is captured by the item values and also. Uh, eigenvectors, and also the residual part is a constant sigma square. And here for now, we are going to assume a constant variance. Then later on, I'm going to um, mention how to extend this to the heterogeneous variance. So our goal is to estimate the number of PCs K. So what is a traditional approach? The traditional approach basically uses a script plot. So basically you plot out the estimated eigenvalues and then find out where's the uh, eigen gap is, and uh, then you uh, make a guess, and uh, then you pick, estimate, um, use a different uh, cutoff, you can estimate as k equal to 6, 9, or 10, or 11, and uh, then, so this is uh, uh, very much ad hoc. So can we make this more systematic? And so that is where this uh, Beamer idea comes from. So instead of starting from top down and uh, looking at the top PCs to see where the gap is, we start from bottom up. And so we basically figure out the bulk eigenvalues and from the bottom, and then fit a curve and then de decide uh, the, what is a, a, a cutoff should be based on statistical properties. So basically suppose the data are, uh, um, IDs and uh, then the covariance matrix is I. Suppose the K and uh, is the um, number of eigenvalues. Suppose we assume the P, this is number of markers and samples divided by sample size goes to a constant. And suppose we calculate empirical eigenvalues. And so basically we compare the empirical eigenvalue histogram with this uh, MP density. This is the density of the eigenvalue when the true correlation is identity. And then we can see that the when the true correlation is identity, the eigenvalue, empirical eigenvalue will follow this bulk distribution. And then we can see how many spec they are. And this will correspond to the number of eigenvalues. Then how can we do this? And um, um, so basically the idea is you first calculate the eigenvalues of your genotype matrix, and then you calculate the quantiles of standard MP distribution. Then you, you fit a simple linear regression of the estimated eigenvalue against the quantile of MP distribution, and the slope is basically sigma square. And then after you estimate the square, uh, sigma square, you find out the cutoff, and uh, then you the, the values, eigenvalue greater than the cutoff provide estimate of the K. And then one can show this estimated eigenvalue um, K, uh, uh, estimated K hat is a consistent estimator of the number of PCs. And so when we apply this to 1000 genome data, and as you recall, the 1000 genome data has 2,500 uh, samples. And uh, then we first, um, in, in the, when we estimate the ancestry PCs, we basically swap the N and P. The N is the number of independent SNP, the LD pruned SNP, and the P is the number of subjects. So in this situation, and after we do the LD pruning, and the N will be 24,000, and the P is 2,500. And the data set have 26 self-reported ethnicity group and that belong to five superpopulation. So the ground truth K is 25. And so this is just the um, PC plot I showed you before. 
And then after we fit the beamer to the estimated empirical eigenvalue, then we can estimate the sigma square, and then we can decide the cutoff. And so this model can be extended to heterogeneous residual variants and by assuming the sigma g follow a gamma distribution. Then after we figure out the distribution, we can decide the uh, statistical cutoff and then above this cutoff that will provide estimate of k. So you can see the truth is 25. The beamer estimated about 28. So that's pretty close to the truth. It performed better compared to the other procedures. So the takeaway from part one is a beamer is a handy random matrix uh, driven approach to estimate the number of PCs, basically the spec eigenvalue in the spec covariance matrix. And it estimated K by estimating the distribution of the bulk eigenvalues. And uh, so it's empirically robust against the misspecification of the residual variance. And also what we applied to 1000 genome data, it shows that Beamer works quite well. And so um, this, this is a part one. So the part two is when we deal with the large bio bank data, we need to handle both population ancestry and the relatedness. And uh, so one approach to do that is to do the mixed model. So for example, if the outcome is a continuous, one can fit the linear mixed model. If outcome is a binary, one can fit the logistic mixed model. When the outcome is a sensor the survival data, one can fit the frailty model. The major challenge is then how can we make this scalable? And uh, so for linear and logistic mixed model, so one can see the uh, left-hand side is basically the transform the link. Right-hand side is X beta, which includes the covariance, and S indicate the individual SNP, and B indicate the random effect, and which follow a, a normal distribution with mean zero and variance theta sigma, and sigma is a GRM matrix. And so if you think about UK bulk bank data, the GG transpose is N by N matrix, that is half million by half million. That's a very large matrix. So therefore, if one just uses the traditional um, software, this is not feasible. And uh, so the so the package for doing this including the GMAT, SAGE, and also STAR. And for the frailty model, that can handle the um, correlated survival endpoint. And for example, age at disease diagnosis and also deaths in the UK bio bank data by introducing the random effect in the Cox model. And the package uh, for fitting this is a gate. The, uh, I'll say a few words about this. So the first problem is uh, when sample size is large, like UK bio bank data, so how can we make the um, fitting scalable? And uh, so idea is we could, if we can make the GRS, GRM matrix sparse, then that can, it will be scalable. And uh, the challenge is the GRM matrix has both ancestry and the family relatedness information. So in other words, the GRM matrix can be decomposed into the low rank matrix that capture the population structure and the block diagonal matrix that capture the uh, family relatedness. So the naive way to do this is to the traditional way is to calculate the GRM like half million by half million matrix. It is expensive. And then you threshold it. And for example, if you use a 0.05, as this basically the fourth degree uh, relatedness um, kingship threshold. And then, um, you, uh, then the question is whether this will make the GRM matrix sparse. So the question, this. Um, if, uh, is this way going to make the GRM matrix sparse in multi-ethnic study? So let me illustrate this using um, UK bio bank data. So here is the UK bio bank data with the three populations, uh, Irish, African, American, African, and uh, South Asian. Now we are going to calculate the naive GRM matrix and the threshold it using 0.05. Then you can see when we threshold it, and the matrix is sparse, but not really sparse. And basically the blocks represent the ancestries. So what this tell us is we need to distangle the population structure and family relatedness. And 
So that is basically this where the fast spark GRM uh, enters into the framework. So the idea is first use the uh, PC air. And so that can calculate the ancestry PC for related sample. If one just directly calculate the sample covariance and then uh, apply the PC, that does not work when we have related sample. So that's why one need to use the PC air. And so this calculates ancestry PCs. And then one regress the genotype on ancestry PC got the residuals. After you got the residual, and then we apply the king and uh, to calculate the kingship. And so this can be used to, to estimate the family structure, basically the block diagonal part of the sigma. And then when one estimates the GRM, GRM, one can only need to calculate the entries of the GRM and for that block diagonal part. So this will reduce computation significantly. So how does this work? So if you look at the figures on the left, this is a naive uh, threshold the GRM. You can see that when we do this naive thresholding and uh, the block represent ancestries. So however, if one applies ancestry adjusted spark GRM, it looks much sparse. And if you zoom in this part, you can see it's really sparse. So basically what this tell us is this ancestry sparse, the adjusted GRM is uh, much sparser. So, and also if you look at the figure on the left, if one fit the uh, mixed model using unadjusted sparse GRM, this naive sparse threshold the GRM, and the QQ plot doesn't fall on the 45 de degree line. However, if one use ancestry adjusted sparse GRM, you see this beautiful 45 degree line. So the second question is, when we have the GRM, should we include both the PC and also GRM matrix? The issue is the GRM matrix has both ancestry and the relatedness information. So as I mentioned, it's important to distangle the role of PC and the GRM. So basically the PCs that enter into the fixed effect, it mod they model the population structure. Ancestry adjusted GRM, it enter into the random effect, they model the relatedness. So therefore for the um, GLMM, and then one put the PCs and in the fixed effect, and then one put the uh, uh, random effect, uh, for assume random effect follow the um, normal distribution with the covariance captured by the ancestry adjusted GRM, sparse GRM. So basically PC capture the population structure and the, the random effect part using ancestry adjusted GRM a sparse GRM capture relatedness. So we need to distangle these two things. So then uh, how can we fit the frailty model? And uh, when we have time to invent GR, uh, time to invent survival data. And so we need to have the frailty model. Uh, a, a, a major challenge in uh, uh, new analysis of file bank data is that there's a heavy censoring. So because the bio bank samples are healthy populations, and so therefore the number of events um, uh, like deaths um, or um, particular disease uh, generally are not very large. And so therefore we need to uh, handle this heavy censoring using the saddle point approximation. And also we need to make it scalable. So this work is co-led by my postdoc Runak Day and Weijo, who's Mark Daly and the Ben News uh, postdoc. So by doing this, uh, by we basically convert the uh, frailty model, the Cox uh, random effect model into a Poisson mix model. And then one can apply the um, uh, GLMM fitting. So you can see the computation using the sparse GRM uh, random effect and it's quite scalable. And so if one use the um, fitting the logistic mix model, frailty model for your UK bio bank data is going to take four hours and a very small memory. Um, so as the other issue I mentioned, the if you look at UK bio bank data, the sensing is very heavy. So if you look at the, um, the heart disease, for example, the sensing is 91% and breast cancer is 93%, Alzheimer's 99.8%. Eight percent. So if one just applies a traditional likelihood ratio or world test, you can see the Manhattan plot looks very messed up. 
And if one applies a saddle point approximation, you can see it's much, much cleaner. So this the saddle point approximation can help addressing the uh, heavy sensory. And so the code and also the GY summary statistic for over 800 time to demand phenotype mm -hmm. of new heat bulb bump data are available at this uh, uh, website. To wrap up for part two, and the fitting the GLM with dense unadjusted GRM matrix is not feasible for large bulb bank and whole genome sequencing studies, such as UK bulb bank studies. And in multi ethnic study, unadjusted GRM may not be sparse. And also, PC plus threshold unadjusted GRM can give a bias association. The QQ plot doesn't fall on the 45 degree line. So the recommendation is to put the PC as a fixed effect, and then for the random effect, and use the ancestry adjusted fast bar GRM to um, model the relatedness. And so then you will be able to control for both population structure and also relatedness. So this is end of part two. Any questions? Uh, Dr. Lin, uh, I'm wondering what's the uh, computation efficiency comparing to other methods of your method? Uh, yes, so for example, if, the, if you look at here, the, so this is a traditional method. Yeah. And uh, so this, you can see it doesn't control um, the, doesn't control the type of error rate well. And also for this, um, we also compare this with uh, uh, CoxMeet is another package. And uh, so it is not scalable, uh, CoxMeet. So, and so here by using the sparse GRI matrix is much more scalable for the UK Bank data. Okay. okay. So we compare with a few existing method, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me move on to part three and how can we analyze whole genome sequencing study? So the, the question is, when we analyze whole genome sequencing study, because the massive number of rare variants, so we need to um, integrate the multi-omic data and the, to help with analysis. So basically, the incorporate the functional annotation and the in the real variance analysis, and uh, then that can empower uh, discovery of the real variance association. And there's a second way is to understand the biologies. I'm glad to hear there are some mediation talk in this conference. And so the idea is um, from the variance to function to phenotype. And so by integrating multi-omic data with the whole genome sequencing and the GWAS data, and then one can understand the causal mechanism and uh, to see um, the, how can one go from the variance with particular variance regulated with particular gene and then affect particular disease. And then the next step is to translate um, the knowledge into action, including the developing prevention intervention strategy and also identify drug target. And because of time limitation, I'm going to focus on the top part. So how can we incorporate functional annotation to empower real balance discovery? And to do this, and the first step is to functionally annotate the whole genome data. And so the, uh, the GSP has a functional annotation working group. The idea is to integrate many different type of omic data and from many existing uh, resources such as ENCODE, the roadmap, and the GTAG, CAD, and so on into this favor um, annotation database. And so right now the database has over 300 annotations and 80% of them are built on build 38. And it include allele frequencies, conservation, uh, function, uh, protein function, epigenetic function, and so on. And so this is available on this website. And so one can download this web, uh, the database. And right now we have annotation of all 3 billion base pairs across the genome. So, um, so in order to do functional annotation, so we um, use, we annotate uh, all the variants across the genome. And because that, um, each particular category functional annotation include many scores. For example, like a ENCODE, it has over 20 or 30 scores. And so therefore we need to do dimension reduction. 
And uh, so, and uh, so we call we call this using the annotation PC. So it basically calculate the first PC of those thirty uh, epigenetic score from encode. So this uh, annotation PCs are different from ancestry PCs. Ancestry PCs are used to measure the ancestry are calculated for each person. Annotation PCs are calculated for each virus measure the function. And so if you look at the heat map here, you can see that there's not much correlation between the conservation and the protein function PCs with, uh, uh, with ancestry, uh, with the epigenetic uh, 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 scores. So therefore, uh, CAD is the single summary measure of function. And so by looking at the heat map, then you can see that in order to measure the function of any individual virus, we need more than one dimension. And so that's why we calculate the uh, annotation PCs for epigenetics, annotation PC for conservation, annotation PC for protein function, and so on. And so we need to multi-dimensional annotation PC to measure the function. And so this database is available at the Fever website, so one can download it. it on, the, um, on the website, one can do a single variance anno um, uh, query, functional annotation query, or the gene level annotation query, or batch annotation. So this work is co-led by the, my computational biologist, Hu Feng, and also my software engineer, Ted. So the, the current, since this is the current status of the sharing functional anno, annotated data. And so the, for the FIBER website, it provides functional annotation of all 3 billion positions, including 9 billion virus. And so this can be downloaded from the FIBER portal. And there's the annotated data, such as a top map uh, annotated um, GDS files, or can be downloaded uh, from the biodata catalyst, and also the CCDG data can be downloaded from Anvil. Those are the um, NH data commons. So the, basically, this is analysis workflow, and using the favor and star um, uh, pipelines. And I'm going to talk about star in a few minutes. Suppose that the investigator have the whole raw genome sequencing um, data, for example, UK biobank data, and also from the phenotype from the UK biobank. And also we have this backend database, which has a nine a billion variants, uh, this favor uh, back on the database. And so those uh, will be available in Biodata Canvas and also Anvil um, as well. So right now it's on the paper website, later on will be integrated in the NH data comment. And then one can run here to do the QC and generate the genotype BCF file that can be um, trans uh, uh, translated into the GBS file, which is much, uh, much have a be much better compression rate. And now one can use this backend fiber backend database to annotate like UK biobank data that will generate the annotated whole genome sequencing um, data. Then one can run the star pipeline by including the phenotype data and then perform the whole genome sequencing analysis. So those pipelines will be available in Anvil and Biodata Catalyst as well. And so now, what is the, how can we incorporate functional annotation in the analysis? So I'm going to uh, explain this, um, the STAR uh, procedures. And so this work was co-led by uh, Si Hao Li and uh, Zilin Li, my former student and postdoc, and uh, in collaboration with colleague at the uh, top med um, lipid working group, uh, Pradeep and Gina, and so on. And so the main idea is to incorporate the functional annotation and to upgrade the functional variance and in to boost analysis power using multi-dimensional functional annotation scores. So the whole genome sequencing analysis pipeline, the input include the phenotype data, covariate and PCs, and the sparse GRM, and also the annotated uh, genotype data using the genotype annotation create AGDS file. For common environments, one can analyze one snippet at a time. For real variants, one can do a, a two ways. One is to use the gene-centric analysis by analyzing the coding mask and non-coding mask. The other is to use the sliding window approach using the fixed window size or dynamic window size. And so the the art is how can we create the mask? This is where the challenges are. For coding masks that uh, are easier, one can group the 
a real variance into loss functional variance and uh, or the uh, disruptive missense variance and the missense variance and uh, um, synonymous variance. And for non-coding variance, for each gene, one could group them into the promoter enhancer using H or DHS uh, or DNS, or upstream, downstream, and also the um, microRNAs. So that is where the challenge is. And because how can we map the variance to each gene and, uh, and identify each um, genes promote and enhancer, they are generally tissue and cell specific. And also mapping is a challenge as well. So this is where the a challenge is. And then one can also do the region, um, genetic region analysis, either use the fixed window size or dynamic window size. So this is basically the star analysis pipeline. And uh, so if the input data will have a genotype data and the spar GIM matrix, and uh, then the phenotype and covariates. And then the next step is to use a fever and to annotate the whole gene, the genotype. And so you have the, the uh, all the variants from, for example, the top map has almost 800 million variants. And then you have them using the fever, one can annotate the 800 million variants. And then the fever also provide the uh, annotation PC. For example, um, one can calculate annotation PC, epigenetics, APC conservation, and APC protein function, and so on. And then this will create functional annotation for different um, dimensions and for each variance. And now you group the variance into the mask. For the gene-centric analysis, you can group the variance into the promoter and the uh, loss functional variance and the missense variance and so on. For sliding window, you can do the um, a fixed window size by having the overlapping windows or dynamic window size. And now what you have is like for each mask and then one can apply the real balance association test statistic I'm going to mention, for example, using the star and uh, we're using the burden, we're using the ACAT. And for using the SCAT, for example, one can use a different weight using the allele frequency to upweight the real variance, and uh, then you calculate the p-value. We use APC IP genetics as a way to calculate the SCAD p-value. We're using the APC conservation as a way to calculate the SCAD p-value, and then combine them using the ACAD. And we can do the same thing for the burden, and also same thing for the ACAD V, and combine them again using ACAD uh, um, method. Then this will create a star O. This will be robust for different uh, weightings and uh, improve the power as well. Then the final product is you will, for each gene, you will have the p value for the association, for the missense variance, for loss functional variance, and for uh, promoters, and also for sliding window as well. So, what, what are the statistics? So, basically, the the burden test is if suppose you have the score statistic for each SNP and the burden statistic calculates a linear combination of the individual score statistic and SCAD calculates the P, uh, statistic using the quadratic uh, function of the score statistic. So you can see that if the effect of those 100 variants in a uh, variant set in the same direction, the burden will have a power. But if the effect are in different direction, or some of the variants are no variants, then burden will lose power, the signal will cancel out, the SCAD will help in that case. And then um, the, there's another approach to combine the p-value. So basically, if you have individual p-values, and then you do the Cauchy transformation, and then you add uh, multiply by the weight, and then this will call the ACAT method to combine the p-value. And so this work was led by my former postdoc, Yao Wu Liu. So this is a quite a nice procedure. It can combine the SNP level p-value and to calculate SNP set uh, p-values, and also can, can combine the p-value using uh, for the different SNP set test statistic with the different weight. So this is a quite a nice, powerful approach to combine correlated p-value. So what is the idea? So if you look at, suppose you have the individual test statistic x. If x follow a normal distribution, if you copy the x bar, then you can see x bar still follow normal 0, 1. If x follow a Cauchy distribution, x bar still follow Cauchy distribution. 
So if x um, are perfectly correlated, this is true. If x are independent, then you can see that the Cauchy distribution x bar still follow a Cauchy, but for normal distribution, x bar doesn't follow normal zero one anymore. It follow normal zero uh, uh, one over d. And so what is nice thing about the Cauchy distribution is that if the if you have a general correlation, X bar still follow a Cauchy in the tail. So that is quite a nice feature. And that provides a nice way for the p-value combination. So basically, heavy tail makes the Cauchy distribution insensitive to correlation. So that provides a nice way, and we because we have a different way to do the weighting, and then how can we combine the different test statistics with the different weight? And uh, so, so for example, if one uses Mendeleev frequency as a weight, one can calculate the scat p-value, do a Cauchy transformation, or use a cat as a weight, calculate the scat p-value, and then do a Cauchy transformation, or you can use annotation. Uh, epigenetic score as a way to calculate the p-value uh, using the SCAD and then do a Cauchy transformation, or using the conservation annotation PC, calculate the SCAD p-value and do a Cauchy transformation. And one way is you just use a different weight and to calculate the p-value, get the minimum p-value. And but we know that is a cheating because when you to take into account and the, the you calculate the minimum p-value, that is a test statistic. And but in order to think out the distribution of the minimum p-value test statistic is complicated because of correlation. But the Cauchy method is much nicer. So if you use the Cauchy method to combine different p-values and still follow a Cauchy, and so therefore and one can have the p-value combination and the calculated in much simpler way. The performance is similar to minimum p-value, but it handles the correlated p-value well. And the copy computation very, very quick. So therefore you can look at if, if one has like the using the star O procedure and for the top metadata is only take um, uh, half an hour for gene-centric analysis. And then for UK bio bank data with 100 CPU, it only take one hour. For the sliding window approach for UK bio bank data, take half no, take one day. So it's quite scalable. And so here's the result applying to analysis the top mat phase five data. Then so for the gene uh, gene centric analysis using different masks, then you can see LDLR um, are associated with several well-known genes, um, like PCSK9, ApoB, and npc one one And uh, so the loss functional variants, missense variants, they are all associated with LDL. And so this all makes sense. And, and also, we also see that the signals are stronger in the coding region than the, than the non-coding region. The natural question is, well, how can we improve the power for the non-coding region, like in the promoter and the enhancer? And so we know that for the uh, promoter and enhancer, they are tissue and cell specific. So here, the sh we show that if one uses the, these phenotype relevant tissue, it can improve the power. So for example, we know LDLR, the relevant, the lipid relevant tissues are liver. So you can see if one use the liver um, epigenetic score as a weight, then you can see we have more discovery. So uh, now this, we also um, want to see how we can improve the scatter test. And uh, so this is a method we call the most, and uh, this is called Minimax Optimal Reach type test. And so this improves the power of the relevance association test when we have a moderate signal strength. So this work was led by my uh, former postdoc Yao Wu Liu, published in uh, JASA um, um, two years ago. So that's just a basic idea. Suppose we have the um, phenotype Y, think about LDLR, and then S indicate the SNP in the, say, uh, loss functional variants of PCSK9, 100 variants. And then the, the, in the traditional SCAD, it basically assumes beta follow a distribution and with mean zero variance tau. And then tau, here we assume beta has this working distribution, and then uh, it's not a prior, it's just working distribution. 
And then the score statistic basically is the um, as transpose y and the sigma is as transpose x. So we know the score statistic will follow a normal distribution with mean mu, sigma, beta, and the sigma. So the goal is test this beta equal to zero. Suppose we are 100 beta, uh, 100 SNP in the promoter region of LDLR, we test 100 beta equal to zero. And so you can see this can be translated into testing tau equal to zero versus tau greater than zero. So this converting testing 100 parameter to a single parameter. So now let's consider the simple alternative tau equal to zero versus tau equal to tau a. So this is suppose we know the signal strength. And suppose the tau a is the true signal strength. And so, so for example, if beta equal to one, two, the true signal strength will be five. And so now let's look at what is the marginal likelihood ratio test. This can be written as the following. And so this basically behave, look like a rich type of uh, test. And uh, so, so this is optimal when we know the true signal strength is tau A. And so what is the scat? The scat is optimal because uh, when tau equal to close to zero, because the scat is the um, variance component test, it's a score test. So therefore, it's a locally most powerful. When, tau, when the signal strength is weak, scat is powerful. How about the traditional F test? F test is optimal when the signal strength goes to infinity. And uh, so what this tells us is a SCAD focus on local alternative when we have a weak signals. And traditional F test was a likelihood ratio test. This focus on strong signals when we have large signal strengths. Then what can we do when the signal strengths are somewhere in the middle? And so this is where the most helps. So what is the most? Suppose we don't know the true signal strength. Suppose this is a true signal strength of tau A. We don't know what that is. Suppose I arbitrarily assume a signal strength at tau C. And this black curve is the oracle. Suppose we know the true signal strength. That will be the true oracle curve and the uh, test. And uh, then uh, this is a Q. Red curve is for giving tau C. And then we construct the power curve for any giving tau C. And then basically we calculate the difference of the, the powers between the oracle curve and the giving tau c curve. And this is basically the risk. And then we find out for which tau a the risk is maximized. And then we try to vary the tau c because we don't know what is the tau a, what is the tau c. We vary tau c and we vary it and until we find for which tau c that gives me the minimum uh, minimum maximum risk. And uh, you can see that when we vary tau c to this level and it give us the uh, minimum max risk. So this is the minimax. And so you can see this is very close to the oracle. So if you compare the most, and uh, so this is the red curve and the black is oracle that assume we know the true signal strength. And then so this uh, yellow is a scat. You can see when the signals are weak, SCAD is powerful. When signal are uh, very large, SCAD lose power. And F test lose power when signals are weak. But when signals are very strong, and then F test, F test will have more power. And so this most, this minimax, you can see that basically give the power very close to the oracle. Computationally, the Computationally, this can be done very quickly. And uh, so using the bisection search and also the computational time is just a little bit more than SCAD. So therefore computationally is very scalable. So here's the result applying the most to the Eric whole genome sequencing data with 400,000 samples. And so this phenotype is lipoprotein and neutrophil count. So you can see that by applying the most, it has much more discovery compared to the F test and also the SCAT. And that all makes sense. So to summarize, and the favor provide a comprehensive whole genome variance functional annotation database and a portal for all three billion positions. So that can be used to annotate any whole genome or whole exome sequencing study as a backend database, such as UK Biobank, Million Veteran Program, or OFAS. And by dynamically incorporating multiple 
variance function annotation and start boost the power of the real variance association studies. And the tissue and cell specific fun functional annotation can boost the power of the real variance association test. And the most improved the power for the real variance association test over SCAT and F test, especially for detecting moderate signals. So I would like to thank many members of the lab. And uh, so they have made um, uh, the, the various distribution and to the work presented today. And also I would like to thank many collaborators and also thank many GSP and TopMed colleagues and also the funding agency. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin, uh, for your last talk and uh, any questions. Okay, it, it, I have a question. So for the uh, for the ACAD method, how is the control of the genomic inflation, Dr. Lin? Uh, we basically the use the PCs, ancestry PCs, and also uh, the uh, sparse GRM to control for population structure and relatedness. So therefore, if you look at the QQ plot, it has this beautiful 45 degree line. Okay, that's good. So the genomic control will be, uh, will be controlled, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another question. So for the SCAD method you mentioned here, did, so did it, the, the, are you using the, the, the very uh, traditional one in, in your early studies? or is a newly developed one? The STAR method built upon the earlier method, the, because early method doesn't allow, only use the allele frequency as the weight. The STAR method incorporate multiple functional notation. So if one use a fixed weight, that will basically the, the SCAT. And okay. uh, so then, um, but if one have, because in reality, different variants have a different function. And so therefore we want to use a different annotation and to do the weighting. And because we don't know um, which annotation will work for which particular variant. So that's why we want to combine different annotation. And so by using different weight and then apply that to the scat or the burden, and then we combine them using the, a kind of method that will okay. give the star method. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, anyone, anyway, if you uh, have any questions, you may ask here or later uh, after the, the, the workshop. And uh, uh, let's thank the, the Dr. Lin for his last talk.